Welcome to the Octa Room, y'all. Shh, shh, shh. Stop talking. You're ruining my concentration. seem like you're having a lot of luck here. Welcome to our new home, Baby's Forever Island, a place where we can be wild and free. You're running a fossilized business that stalled out way below its potential, and it's killing my soul. <gasps> okay. We are pleased to bring you the 13th installment of our Learn, Create and Grow webinar series, Animation for Toons, brought to you by Technicolor Creative Studios Academy. I'm Annabelle, a training coordinator here at the Academy, and it is a true delight to have all of you here today. Our team is thrilled to have you here, and we urge you to stay with us until the end, as we have some fantastic prizes to give away. Learn, Create and Grow is a webinar series designed specifically for students and artists by Technicolor Creative Studios Academy. The masterclasses provide students with a unique opportunity to gain an understanding of the work of various disciplines within the VFX industry. We introduce a new episode each month that enables artists like you to explore a broad range of topics through VFX masterclasses conducted by our expert trainers. Today, we will examine the skills associated with animation for tools. Before we go any further, let me introduce you to our esteemed speaker, Lizalette Gracia, a trainer at the Academy. Lizalette started her animation journey in the year 2000 when she joined Militoon Animation. As a result of her passion and creativity, she quickly found herself in the dynamic world of 3D animation, where she used her talents at DQ Entertainment. Over the course of her career, Lizalette contributed her exceptional talents and artistic vision to a variety of cartoon series. Among the most notable contributions are Le Nerves, Donkey Oli, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse 1 and 2, Tact the Power of Juju, Peter Pan, Penguins of Madagascar, and Land First, in addition to motion capture for movies such as Barbie Diaries and Prodigies. Beyond her professional achievements, Lizalette's interests are as diverse as her talents, spanning from oil painting and sewing to crocheting, culinary exploration, and more. Our interactive chat box provides you with the opportunity to ask questions, share your experiences, and discuss challenges related to animation. Lizalette and our team will be available to assist you as needed. Thank you, Annabelle, for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Lizalette Gracia, a games animation trainer at Technicolor Creative Studios Academy. I'm excited to share my expertise in cartoon animation with you today. I hope this information will inspire you all. Without further ado, let's get started with our webinar on the art of toon animation. By the end of this webinar, you will gain a clear understanding of what is cartoon animation? What is the difference between traditional hand-drawn animation and computer-generated animation? 
How has technology influenced the evolution of cartoon animation over the years? And what are the key principles of animation that animators follow in the cartoon animation? 3D cartoon animation, also known as computer-generated animation, is a modern animation technique that brings characters and worlds to life in a three-dimensional digital environment. Here's a simple explanation for a newcomer. In 3D cartoon animation, everything is created and manipulated on a computer, instead of drawing individual frames by hand as in traditional 2D animation. Animators use specialized software to build three-dimensional characters. These digital characters and objects can be moved and posed in 3D space, just like real-life puppets. The process involves creating a digital skeleton for characters, which is called a rig, and then animators use this rig to pose and animate the characters. The software calculates how these 3D models move and interact with their environment, creating lifelike movements and actions. 3D animation is widely used in movies, television shows, video games, and even educational content. As a fresher, learning 3D cartoon animation involves mastering the software tools, understanding character design, and developing skills in animating 3D models. It is an exciting field with many creative possibilities and opportunities for those interested in bringing characters to life. The key priority for someone looking to become a 3D cartoon animator is to understand the principles of animation. Studying the core principles of animation, such as timing, spacing, squash and stretch, and anticipation, is a good start. These principles apply to 3D animation just as they do to 2D animation. Here's how you can get a grasp of these animation principles. Begin by studying the principles of animation from books like Cartoon Animation by Preston Blair, The Animator's Survival Kit by Richard Williams, Timing for animation by Harold Whitaker. Analyze and watch a variety of animations, both 2D and 3D. Pay close attention to how characters move. Try to identify how the principles of animations are applied in different scenes. Choose short animation sequences or scenes and break them down frame by frame. This will help you see how the principles are applied in practice. Observe real life movements and interactions. Understand how people and objects move in the physical world. This knowledge can be applied to make your animations more lifelike. Animation is a skill that takes time to develop. Be patient and practice regularly. Over time, you'll improve and become proficient in applying the principles of animation. Let's discover the magic of 3D cartoon animation. Thank you for that fascinating session, Lizlet. Let's take a brief break to play some trivia where you have the chance to win some exciting prizes. Just pay attention to the questions and type the answer into the chat box as quickly as possible. What is the random iris movement called? What is the name of the villain in The Lion King? What color are SpongeBob's eyes? Animal tries to attack Ariel and Flounder at the beginning of the movie. What is the name of the dog in the Tom and Jerry series? Keep an eye on your inbox as our team will contact the winner via email. Thank you for sharing your answers. 
we invite you to take advantage of the opportunity to explore the Academy's courses and learn more about the application process by clicking on the link in the upper right corner of your screen. Additionally, you can access our past webinars by clicking in the link in the description box. Let's discover the magic of 3D cartoon animation. Traditional 2D animation requires various equipments and materials like light box, peg bar, animation paper to animate. In 2D animation, every frame is hand drawn. Few examples of traditional 2D animation movies are Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty. Likewise, we have clay animation or claymation. This is a stop motion animation technique that uses sculpted characters and objects made from clay to create animation sequence. Be it 2D, claymation or 3D animation, we must know the fundamentals of animation. Let's see more about this. Cartoon Animation by Preston Blair, published in 1948, is a classic resource for aspiring animators. He has worked for Walt Disney Productions and MGM. His book is a comprehensive guide to principles of animation and includes step-by-step -step instructions for animators to understand the fundamentals of animation. Let me explain few of the fundamentals of 2D drawing. Character Construction and Proportion He has explained how to construct characters from basic shapes like circles and ovals. Head construction is important to understand the construction of the head to identify various head positions while posing and animating a character. It is an imaginary line that runs through the spine of the character and helps to create a dynamic pose. Line of action creates a sense of flow and balance in the drawing. We will begin posing the keyframes. Prepare the scene file, import the character and create a scene camera. Position the character in the camera angle, turn on the safe action and safe title. We start with a weight shift on the hip. Then we work on the line of action on the spine. Work on the X, Y, Z angles of the spine. Work on the hand starting from the shoulder joint. Position the pole vector properly to get a nice flow of lines. Offset the fingers. Check the character in all the angles for proper line of action, balance, appeal and emotion. The second pose is pushed towards the left leg. Rotate the spine controls backwards and to the right. Remember the line of action. Position the feet and pole vector. Move on to place the hands in the correct place. Get a nice flow of lines from right hand to the left hand. It shouldn't break at the shoulder. Adjust the pole vector and put the hands on the hip. Do not rotate too much. Position the fingers to touch the bow. So adjust all the spine controls. Flip between the two keys to check the transition. Moving on to the third pose. Here the hip is down and pushed back. Position the legs and hands. Pose the fingers and tail. Flip between all the three frames and plan the breakdowns and in-betweens. We are going to see what does ease in and ease out by taking a simple example of a hand pointing animation. Here we have two keys, one on frame 1 and one on frame 9. Frame 5 is the breakdown. So in between 1 and 5 we have the slowing out and in between 5 and 9 we have slowing in. So we have the slow out, then the slow in, ease in or cushion in. While doing the breakdown, make sure your hand position is like the second example. Moving on to the Maya file, we have a hand loaded in the Maya file with a reference image. So let's 
quickly make the keyframes and see how to give ease in and ease out. We have the two keys here, one on frame one and nine, and the transition is going to be like this. So we don't have a breakdown or ease in or ease out added here. The in-betweens are computer generated and we don't have a breakdown. So we have to add this breakdown. After adding the breakdown, we can see the difference between the first play blast and the second one. So this is after adding the breakdown. To get the ease out, adjust the spacing by adding a key in between and adjust the graph to get a slow to fast action. Make sure the graph is very smooth. Do the same thing with the fingers and adjust the graph. Let's mark the spacing. Let's check whether it is slow to fast. So in the first three keys we see that the elbow is very close and then the space is far away. So that is the spacing between the first key and the breakdown and the second key. Now we have given the slow out or ease out. So the action will be slow to fast. The hand shouldn't be too stiff. So I am just giving a slight bend to the elbow to make it smooth. Now we'll add ease out just by giving auto tangent to the fingers also. So we'll have a ease in and ease out. Make sure the graph is bent and not straight. So you have a slow end, a cushion to the action. Now that we know ease in and ease out, let us see what is overshoot. So here the hand shoots out too far and returns to the final position. Let's compare this with the cushion action. The overshoot is shoots far whereas here the hand decelerates in the end. Hard and soft accent. Accents can be hard or soft. In animation terms, a soft accent eases in and a hard accent bounces back. It shows someone pointing. A hard accent goes past the extreme point, bouncing back, and a soft accent settling into the extreme pose. The difference is on the emphasis. In this example, someone might be pointing vigorously, shouting and pointing quickly. Whereas in this example, someone might be pointing slowly with his hand settling into the final pose. They are not shouting. They aren't in a hurry. When we are doing character animation, we often have to choose between a hard accent and a soft accent. Arc is the seventh principle of animation. Everything in nature moves in a circle or an arc. We should have the breakdown key to get the arc and flow of animation. For example, this hand movement is rigid. So we need to add in the breakdown key, we will break the joint. If we take the example of a person slapping the table, the elbow leads the action. After moving up, the elbow comes down and the hand keeps moving up and the palm slaps the table. The elbow will come down first, followed by the forearm and the fist. The Animator Survival Kit is a valuable resource offering practical techniques and principles that are essential for creating lifelike animations. With this example from Animator Survival Kit, let us understand what is keyframe, extremes, breakdowns and in-betweens. The keyframes tell the story. Here we have three keyframes telling the story that he has to take a few steps forward to pick up the chalk and write on the boat. The extremes will include foot contact, passing position, then we add the breakdown and in-betweens, then the secondary actions like hair and tail. What is a keyframe? The key drawings are called extremes and the pose in between the extremes are called as in-betweens. The most important pose is the key pose and all the other poses in between should flow towards the key pose. Work on the key poses with a reference image. Observe the following when you work on the key poses. A strong pose will have a good silhouette and will express the appeal and emotion of the character to the audience. 
push the pose and make it more dynamic and interesting. Even if it is still, a good pose has motion in it. Let's study the line of action, balance and emotion in these poses. The line of action is an imaginary line through the character's body indicating the direction and force of the pose. Let us compare the first two poses. This pose has no line of action. All the lines are almost straight with no flow of line, no balance and no force. Whereas in this pose we have a proper line of action. We can see the flow of lines from fingertip to shoulder to the other hand and hip upwards to the head and down the legs. Vary the line of action by reversing it to create contrast between poses. What's balance? When we talk about balance, we should remember center of gravity. In a balanced pose, the weight of the body needs to be supported by one leg or distributed evenly or unevenly between both the legs. When the character is standing and has the weight evenly distributed among the feet, the line we draw from head downward to the ground will be at the midpoint between the feet. If the weight is shifted to the right leg, then the balance line will shift to the right foot. In this pose, there is proper balance, breakdown and in-betweens. If you move to the mid keys between the keyframes, the computer will generate poses. This pose cannot be used or edited. We have to think what we want to do in the breakdown. Do you want to move in upper arc or lower arc? Should the character move slow to fast or fast to slow? Should you add overshoot and settle in the end? Decision making ahead of time will help in a better workflow. While posing, where to position the hip for the breakdown? If you choose the lower arc, then drop the hip between the keys. If the hip is positioned halfway, then the timing will be even. If the hip is closer to the first key, then the action will be slow in the beginning and snappier in the end with uneven spacing. Here we have three poses in the Maya file. Add breakdown poses in between the keys. Observe the in-betweens created between the frames. Play with the spacing and timing. Let's talk about the in-betweens. Here we have three poses in the Maya file. Add breakdown poses in between the keys. Observe the in-betweens created between the keyframes and the breakdowns. Let us see spacing and timing in detail. Even spacing. Here I mark the hip and head positions. If the spacing has to be even, then we will have the breakdown at the midpoint of these two positions. The character is moving straight from key to key. We start with the hip, so move the hip down. Hip will move in the lower arc. This is even timing because the character moves the same distance with even spacing and timing. Similarly, have imaginary points on the wrists to track the hand movements in an arc. I have decided to take the lower arc and slow to fast timing. So place the hip closer to the first key. Favor the head to the first key and adjust the leg for proper balance. Decide what you want to do with the arc, spacing and timing. Here in the first example, we lead with the hip. The hip is closer to the second key. The head is dragging and it is closer to the first key. The spine curves more on the breakdown to make the body flexible and to show variation in the line of action. The action is fast to slow. The hip is moving in lower arc. It is fast to slow. Hand is in even spacing and lower arc. The left hand is moving in upper arc. The head is spaced evenly. We delay or lead with the head. The head is turning in the lower arc. The head is rotated down in x-axis in the breakdown. Mark points on the nose to find the arc. In the next breakdown, the hip is moving down. The line of action is reversed to create contrast in the action. Observe the movement of the head. Take the nose as the reference point to check the arc again. Observe the line of action and how it is reversed. By marking the nose and hands, observe the arc in the head and the hands. Squash and stretch is a term that we hear very often in animation. So what is squash and stretch? 
Squash and stretch is a fundamental principle of animation that makes animation look more lifelike and dynamic. Squash and stretch can be understood by practicing bouncing ball animation. When a bouncing ball hits the ground, it momentarily squashes or flattens upon impact and then stretches as it rebounds. Similarly, in animation, a character's body can be squashed and stretched to emphasize the impact of a jump or action. Let's animate the squirrel skip cycle by applying these animation principles. Have a reference video in image sequence and load it into Maya. In the attribute editor, remember to keep the use image sequence option checked. If this option is unchecked, then you will see only one image. To adjust the starting pose of the reference video, you can change the number in the frame offset. Reduce the image plane size and position it by changing the values. Select all the controls and mark the keyframes. Let's make it interesting by adding squash and stretch first. Grab the head control and push it down for the squash and you can adjust it in the graph editor. Use the copy and paste options to get the value in the alternate keys. Now move the head controls up for the stretch. The bounce is exciting to animate further, isn't it? Hold the master and work on the body tilt. Now translate the master up in the y-axis. Copy the same value for now. We can reduce or increase the height of the skip later. Now the skip has even spacing and timing. Select weighted tangents and give hang time. And the key will be linear when the character lands. The time taken for the landing is faster because of gravitational force. You can create an anim layer and make the cycle progressive. The layer can be turned off if not required. When the squirrel lands on the ground, there will be no translate Z movement. The distance can be adjusted in the graph.
Now select the spine control and work on the line of action. The first pose is an anticipation and a squash pose. The body will be bent forward. Make sure that you copy and paste the values carefully. Work on the head tilt and head delay. You have to check your file frequently by making a play blast. Also by marking points, you can check if the spacing is correct. Go to the graph editor to make sure the graph is smooth. Copy the values if required. The in-between keys will favor the previous keys in head delay. In the front view, move the spine for better line of action. We can copy and paste the keys for more cycles. Select all the controls and copy and paste connect the keys. Paste connect the translate Z keys in the anim layer also. We can reduce the height of the skip or gradually reduce the height by scaling down the y-axis graph. Animate the lower body in the contact and take off. The lower body will drag when it takes off and there will be a hang time when it is in the air. And we can elongate the body using the lower body control. Here we animate the lower body control of the squirrel like that of the legs in a jump. We can fine tune the shot further. We're going to talk about overlapping action. Let's understand follow through with the example of a simple pendulum. Observe the swing. The movement is initiated from the base. The pendulum swings continuously and stop. What happens in between the two keys? We have the breakdown. How should we post the breakdown? So the breakdown has a delay and an overlapping action. The end will delay and the base will lead. So in the breakdown, favor the base that is the source of movement closer to the next key. Moving on to posing the breakdown, we can see that we are posing the base of the pendulum favoring the third key and the breakdown is dragging in between. Let's try one more cycle. So in between these two cycles also we will follow the same rules. Favoring the base like this and dragging the tail. We can follow the same thing till the pendulum stops swinging. So 
when it comes to, to the end, it's very difficult to adjust. It's better to work on the graph editor. All we are going to do as we work further is to bring the extremes closer together. So it's going to be extreme, another extreme keyframe and then a breakdown in between. Only thing is that the space between both extremes keep reducing and you have the same breakdown till the end. After we are done with all the breakdowns, we'll move the keys apart and see how this works. If you feel it is very stiff, then move the extremes far away and increase the drag on the breakdowns. So do not go beyond the first key, that will pop. We can add keys after the first key to show little more drag. Same thing when it comes back also. A recap again. We have two extreme keys. One is curved this way and the next key is curving the other way. All we have to do is create an in-between that is the breakdown which will overlap as well as drag. So the base will favor the second key and the, the tail will drag and it will be closer to the previous key. So we'll do this throughout. This is applicable for body, tail, hair, all the secondary actions. Let's apply this to this character. So on key two, the character is bending forward. So I'm not uh, concentrating on the balance of the character, just to show you how the in-betweens are to be done. So in the breakdown, that's on key one, what we're supposed to do is we'll favor the hip to zero. Yes, so it will tilt forward more closer, whereas the upper body will be favoring the previous key that is bent backward. So just spreading the keys out so we can see the delay. The hip stops and then the body follows. So we have the wave like the whip like movement in the body while animating. Your body will not be stiff. So whenever you have an action always try to give a whip action or follow through in between. So remember this. So there should be a reason why you move the hip first and then delay the head or the upper body. Let's see the tail movement. If these two are the extreme keys, the breakdown will be like this. The base of the tail will favor the second key and the tip of the tail will favor the first key. So the base is initiating the movement. So the same thing happens in the reverse direction. When the tail is going up, the base will favor the upper key and the tip will drag behind. This will be the very basic for doing the follow through. Later we will fine tune the graph, we'll add more keys in between and make the follow through very smooth and we'll also add the path according to the direction of movement. The tail will not be moving in any one direction like rotate X, Y or Z. It will move according to the body in all the directions. So when we animate the body, we have to animate the tail according to the body movement. Start working on the tail animation. Take the reference from the reference video. And remember that the tip of the tail should point towards the direction the body had moved from. Adjust the controls keeping in mind the wave movement in follow through and overlapping action. Create additional keyframes to show how the tail follows the character's movement with a slight delay.
The tail might continue to sway or curl a bit after the character stops. The tail movement is exaggerated when the character changes direction or speed. Make sure that the transition between keyframes is smooth to create a natural flow in the tail animation. Follow through and overlapping action are essential principles in animation that make characters and objects appear more lifelike and dynamic. To understand this principle better, observe the tail of an animal or a flag or any object with a flexible structure. Also consider the weight of the tail before animating it. Heavier tails will have slower, more deliberate movements while lighter tails may react quickly to change in motion. The tail should not distract from the main action but should enhance it. Adjust the timing and spacing between keyframes to control the speed and flow of the tail's animation. Experiment with different timing to achieve the desired effect. Follow through animation in the tail might require some practice and experimentation. We will see in detail how to animate a blink, how to work on eye directions and eye darts. We will also see how the upper lid and lower lid will be animated in a blink. When the character has a normal closed eye, remember to move the upper lid properly to close it completely. Also remember that the upper lid has the ability to move by itself, but the lower lid cannot move by itself. It needs the push of the cheek muscles to move up. There are some places when we don't close the eyes completely. So the upper lid will not close on a quick blink or a quick half blink. So those are the exceptional cases we do not close the eyes completely. When do we animate the lower lid? We animate the lower lid when the character smiles. When the character has a wide smile, the cheek muscles are pushed up. When the cheek muscles are pushed up, the eyelids are pushed up, so the eyes will become smaller. When we animate the blink, we will not close the eyes exactly in the center line. We will always close it a little lower or a little higher to the middle line. This is because the lower lid cannot move by itself unless and until the character smiles and the cheek muscles push the lower lids up. When we animate the blink, move the upper lid below the center of the eye. When we animate a smile, we move the lower lid above the center of the eye. So what happens when the character smiles? When the character smiles, the cheek muscles are pushed up and the cheek muscles in turn act on the lower lids pushing it up. Brows, eyes and mouth including the cheeks will not animate separately. Movement in the mouth will affect the cheeks and the eyes. 
We do not animate the brows, eyes, cheeks and lips separately. There is some connection between each other. When we have a wide smile, the cheek muscles are pushed up and the cheek muscles will push the lower eyelid up and we pose the eyebrows accordingly. When we have some close-up shots, we have to shadow the shape of the eyebrow on the eyelids. If we have controls for the eyelids, rotate it slightly to match the shape of the eyebrows. It shouldn't be rotated too much, but animated to the minimum. When we animate a blink, the blink timing can be two frames to close, two frames to hold and two frames to open. So this will vary in realistic animation. In realistic animation, the character will take more than five to six frames to open his eyes or it will take seven to eight frames to close the eyes and there will be a long hold in the closed eye before the eye opens. In cartoon blink, we close the eyes on frame two and make sure the eyes are closed properly and we keep the eyelids closed on frame four as well. So from two to four, the eyes will remain closed and it can be a perfect hold or a moving hold. Go to the graph editor and hold the handles and give the moving hold like this. Make sure it is very less, otherwise it will look like an added movement. We should only feel the moving hold. To make the blink even better, we have to give an uneven timing to the close and the open. So grab the upper lid and make the timing uneven while closing and opening by inserting a key in between. We can add a slight movement in the eyebrows and the lower lid if the shot is very tight. Add a slight movement in the eyebrows and give uneven spacing. Make sure the brow doesn't travel with the eyes. Now let's add a small movement to the lower lid. We can polish the blink further. The other eye controls can be used to make the blink even better. Avoid zombie eyes in the in-betweens. This can be prevented by manually keying the pupil control. Go to the in-between frames where the eyeball is not visible. Hold the eyeball control and translate it down so that the iris is visible on all the frames. We do not close our eyes in all the blinks. Some blinks are called half blinks. We do half blinks after a full blink. So in a half blink, what we do is we do not close our upper lid completely. The upper lid will come half the way and it will open back. We can even animate the lower lid in a half blink. We can adjust the timing in the graph We change our eye directions after a blink. So when we change our eye direction, the eyeball should not pop or float during the blink. How to animate this perfectly? To avoid this, we have to do the transition when the eyes are closed. Eye directions. If we have an object and the character has to see the object, do not place the aim on the object. If we place the aim on the object, it will look like the character is looking at it in the perspective view, but in the camera view, it will not match. Fix the aim properly in the camera angle. You can also move the individual control separately. We can follow a few methods to find the eye direction. So have an imaginary vertical and horizontal line running across the eyeball with the pupil at the center. If this horizontal and vertical line shifts to the right or to the left, the pupil will position itself accordingly. So always have an imaginary vertical and horizontal line to find the position of the pupil. In the next method, we have an imaginary line passing through the eyes to the object. The line passing through both the eyes should not go beyond the object but meet at a point. If the line crosses in front of the object, that is where the eye locate will be. And if the line goes beyond the object and if it is meeting beyond the object, that is where the look at will be. If the object is placed 
below the eye level then we have to position the eyes like this if we move the eye control a little behind or inside the object it may not match in this case the eye direction is not on the object but far behind the object always remember to work in the camera angle to fix the eye direction when the character is looking down we should not have an excited eyes so remember to move the upper lid down to avoid excited eyes the eye makes some rapid repetitive uncontrolled movements such as up down side to side or in circles this movement is called eye dart or saccadic movement let us see how to animate the eye dart while doing the eye dart we should make sure that we do not change the eye direction the eyeball will keep shifting in the golden triangle that is between the two eyes and the mouth or the forehead it keeps going around the face so make sure you do not change the eye direction do not move the eye control in all the directions like this or change the eye direction we give two frames for the direction change so you can do it on one axis if it is x translate it in x and make sure it doesn't translate so much and change the eye direction then we have a hold for two frames or four frames and we have the next shift in the direction so if the eye direction is moving from point A to B, that is from 40 to 42, then it is on hold till 46. So in 48, what should happen is, it shouldn't go back to A. We should give a new position. So maybe we can animate the Y and give a new direction and let it go from A to B to C. So never go back to and fro, so that will not be natural. We can also adjust the timing in the graph editor. Select the graph editor and move the keys like how I'm showing you. Shift the keys and place a key just before our point B and shift it back. So we can get a slow to fast or a fast to slow movement in the, in the two keys. So when we make a play blast and check, it should be very natural and subtle to remember that practice is key. To become proficient in cartoon animation, it is important to practice regularly and refine your skills. Thanks to everyone who took part in the session. I hope you enjoyed it. Apply today and start your journey in cartoon animation at Technicolor Creative Studios Academy. Thank you. Over to you, Annabelle. Thank you very much, Lizalette, for that wonderful session. We extend our sincere thanks to all the participants who joined us for today's informative and engaging webinar. We hope you found it both valuable and enjoyable. Please feel free to contact us with any additional questions or inquiries through the contact details displayed on your screen. Please feel free to share the recording of the webinar with anyone who may benefit from it if they were not able to attend. You can stay up to date with the upcoming episodes and exciting content by staying connected with us on social media. In the meantime, keep those creative sparks alive and take care of yourself. We look forward to welcoming you back to the next installment of Learn, Create and Grow.